that sound though. <laughs> Okay, we are live now. I'll broadcast the um, event. Hello and welcome. Welcome to today's webinar, which is hosted by Amrita Seattle. We are discussing doing it the right way, where we're talking about rural community development, education and social impact, and proven ways for delivering change, really changing the trajectory of a child's life. And I am, um, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Nancy Muller. I um, have just recently retired from PATH where I worked for 34 years as a senior program officer in global health and um, led the menstrual health team there. I'm currently working as a consultant in global health and also am privileged to be on the board of Amrita Seattle. Um, I would like to ask you all to please use the chat box and put in any questions that you have for the panelists into that chat box so that at the end we can curate the questions and respond to them. I am very uh, happy to introduce the amazing group of panelists we have here today. I'm just gonna give you a brief introduction right now. And then later on when we hear um, from them and pose questions to them, I'll give more information about each of them. We have Dr. Rukmini Banerjee, who is the CEO of Pratham. We have Jacob Leaf, the founder and CEO Ubuntu Pathways. Ajit George, Director of Operations, Shanti Bhavan Children's Project. Dr. Marguerite Theophile, the founder of Weave. Ishe Tunduk, the Director of Ladakh Ecology and Development Group, Principal of Lamdan Model Senior Secondary School in Ley, retired from this recently. And Unit Doma, who is an Amrita Seattle Pathways Fellow. And we have Sharmila Paul, who is the CEO of Amrita Seattle. So um, I would like to just describe uh, Amrita Seattle briefly for those of you who are not as familiar with it. Amrita Seattle is a nonprofit which is based in Seattle, Washington, and it was founded by Dr. Sujit and Shampa Paul. Their mission is to live, to serve, to end generational poverty. Amrita Seattle serves the utmost vulnerable children in rural isolated parts of India, ranging from the snow-capped Himalayas in Ladakh to the dense mangrove island forests of Bengal and provides them with stable education, health, and support. And in addition to this work in India, Amrita Seattle, I think in a, in a stroke of genius also, um, for the past 11 years actually, has served the underprivileged community in Seattle, um, it, particularly the at-risk homeless youth through a program called Teen Feed and Root Shelter and multiple tent cities, and they provide them with hot meals, the, the young people with hot meals. These massive efforts on the part of Amrita Seattle and their volunteers um, in making these meals during the COVID times has earned them the COVID Hero Award this year. In 2020, Amrita served over 1,800 hot meals and ongoing. So Amrita Seattle's mission is to live to serve generational poverty. Amrita Seattle serves vulnerable children living in the utmost rural isolated parts of India, and the objective is to empower them to achieve their full potential and break out of generational poverty. This includes from sending a child to school to providing them with access to tutorials, classroom supplies and libraries, doctor's checkups, home visits, birthday parties, Amrita Seattle provides children with everything that they need, every step of the way, not just to survive. But... That was all not heard, I'm kidding. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome to the Amrita Seattle webinar. This is hosted by Amrita Seattle, and it uh, is about doing it the right way, which includes unmuting oneself. 
where we will be discussing rural community development and social impact and proven ways for delivering change and truly changing the trajectory of a child's life. I would like to invite you all to use the chat box to include your questions to the panelists, which are, are an amazing group of people representing very different perspectives on these issues of community development and education. Um, my name is Nancy Muller. I am recently retired from PATH where I worked for 34 years, uh, most recently as a senior program officer and led the menstrual health team there. Um, I'm on the board of Amrita Seattle. That's also very recent. I'm very happy to be doing that. And I'm also consulting. I'd like to introduce you to this amazing group of panelists. We have Dr. Rukmini Banerjee, the CEO of Pratham, Jacob Leaf, founder and CEO of Ubuntu Pathways, Ajit George, the Director of Operations, Shanti Bhavan Children's Project, Dr. Marguerite Teofil, the founder of Weave, and Ishe Tundup, the Director of Ladakh Ecology and Development Group and former principal of Lamdon Model Senior Secondary School in Leh, Unith Dolma, an Amrita Seattle Pathways Fellow, and um, Sharmila Paul, the CEO of Amrita Seattle. Shall we go to the video now, or I'm not clear if people heard the introduction already. Yeah, they did. So I got muted. So um, we're, we're now going to look at the, a video of Amrita Seattle's work in providing a child with a lifetime of support. I think Balaji, the audio isn't coming through. Came looking for help. He feared for her and the heavily abusive environment she was facing at her boarding school. Nima represents one of so many children who must endure a severe lack of parental care, who live without access to basic necessities and educational support, and are often led into lives of domestic labor. These children deserve everything that all children deserve in order to survive and thrive. Ten years ago, when Shujit and Shampa Pal founded Amrita Seattle, they started small, trying to address a single aspect of this educational crisis in utmost rural India. Working within local schools, they distributed academic supplies and provided scholarships to a handful of vulnerable children living in the Himalayas and in the island of Sundarbans, West Bengal. Their commitment to selfless service and to transform a child's life gained trust and reputation in the community and began to expand. We established reading centers, implemented tutorials and meal programs, facilitated health camps, and led wellness campaigns. Our hard work produced results. Students achieved a 95% high school graduation rate, an 88% college graduation rate, and 100% employment placement. But beyond numbers, our biggest lesson learned was that education alone wasn't enough to help vulnerable children overcome the odds stacked against them. The gap in opportunity is too complex. Even when students have school supplies, many still struggle in the classroom, distracted by hunger, issues at home, and health. We realized that to truly change the trajectory of a child's life, we need to go deeper and focus on the child as a whole. So much of what we do at Amrita Seattle goes beyond any metric. It's in the meals we have together, the doctor checkups, the study sessions, the psychosocial support, the road trips, the birthday celebrations, and so much more. We're providing something that every child in this world deserves, a childhood. Nima transitioned into our residential facility and a brand new school and began to receive the constant support care, and love that all children should be receiving. It took time, but gradually she showed us her true confidence, her assuredness, and her great ability to make us all laugh. Nima! This is Nima today, 
Now she is thriving in middle school and aspires to become a veterinarian. That dream is now a possibility. When given everything they need to thrive, children can accomplish unprecedented success. Now is the time to build off of successes like Nima's. We present our bold new vision, the Amrita Center, a world-class facility that will contain the region's first early education center, state-of-the-art libraries and classrooms, computer labs, a counseling wing, a vocational training hub, an auditorium, a playground, and full boarding facilities. A place where kids want to grow up. Our promise is that in the next five years, we will have an Amrita Center operating in each of our sites and be taking on 300 children on an individualized pathway out of poverty. This is our key to ensuring that vulnerable children can exit generational poverty and become empowered the Amrita Center will be a bold symbol of our deep commitment to the communities we serve and ultimately a bold vision in the development sector, an example for change makers around the world. Amrita Seattle is built from the slogan, live to serve. Will you join us? That was great. Um, it's so inspiring to see the work of Amrita Seattle. And uh, I would just like to draw people's attention to the, um, the links, the live links that are on in the chat boxes. Um, and they'll be shown throughout this video at different points. Um, they are places to donate. This is actually taking the place of the, the fall gala that we were planning. But because of COVID, obviously, we're doing this all remotely. So we have a wonderful series of um, webinars and music events, concerts, and um, invite you to attend as many as you can. So there's a live link in the chat box and um, to the donation campaign. And also, um, there's a benefit auction. So stay tuned to that. And it's actually live now. So you can go on um, at any point uh, until the end of October. And there will be, there are lots of wonderful items in that auction for you to consider. So now I am very, um, it also actually to, to show you here that uh, draw your attention to there's a live um, text option as well. You can text this number 44321 um, on your phone and make your contribution that way. So moving on, I'm very happy to introduce you to Sharmila Paul. Um, who is the CEO of Amrita Seattle. Sharmila is the chief executive officer. She is based between, in normal times, between Seattle, the office, and um, in the cities in India, in the areas of India, the rural areas where Amrita works. She's been with Sia in uh, Amrita Seattle for seven years and has brought uh, over, well, actually, she's, she's brought over seven years of experience in her life of all aspects of grassroots service and social impact. Sharmila holds two bachelor's degrees and also a master's in marine chemistry from the University of South Carolina and nonprofit leadership and management from the University of Pennsylvania. Sharmila, um, I would love to get your insights and information about how you decided to become involved in the first place with Amrita Seattle, with all this background you have, um, what brought you to work in rural development and community um, education and development? So um, I, I was not in community development, social work, community work. Um, my background was in chemistry and, and oceanography. Um, I was working on, um, always worked in a lab, um, in a marine research lab. I was going on um, international research expeditions to the some of the remotest corners of the world. Um, my graduate school thesis work was in the Arctic Ocean, where we spent about four months. And, um, and I think it was during that time of, um, of graduate school when I just felt that um, there was some piece of the puzzle that was missing in my life and it was and I needed time to to sort of recalibrate my life and uh, and find find its its new purpose so that was when I uh, after my graduate school I took off to India I went back to India after a period of about 11 to 
12 years and I, I went to, to Ladakh, which is up high in the, in the Himalayas. Um, I was connected with, uh, with the local school, the, the Lambdon School, um, of which the principal was then Sir Ishetondo. He looks like isn't able to join right now. But, um, and while I was, I was working with, with kids, I was also traveling. Um, I went into um, some of the most remote corners of the Himalayas, which a lot, still a lot of the local people haven't, haven't traveled to yet. Um, we've been right to the borders of, of India and, and, and Tibet and um, been with, you know, and saw villages that are still unknown to the rest of the world, um, absolutely pristine, uh, vast Tibetan plateaus. I mean, these are places right out of from your your nighttime dreams. I mean, it's it's it's, it's just stunning. Um, I went through all of a large, large part of India by myself, and it was in these powerful transformative moments that, and being in these um, pristine, beautiful places as well. I s gradually saw after a pursuit of about two to three years, as slowly as I went really deep with the with the people, I, I began to see their their vulnerability of of children how. Um, children living really at the frontiers of the last frontiers of this world really struggled to um, have access to basic facilities, um, you know, achieve uh, achieve their dreams, their aspirations, and um, and it was um, after a pursuit of two to three years, I decided that I want to I want to make I want to use my skills to make an impact on on people. So I uh, became the program officer of of Amrita Seattle. I lived in I live in lived in Ladakh pretty much. I knew I wanted to settle there um, and uh, and be a part of of the people that I that I serve and work with. Um, and um, yeah, it was it's been still be, it's been an incredible journey. It's um, I've lived in temperatures of you know minus thirty degrees with almost no heat, you know, but very minimum heating. Um, there's there are times when we we don't have running water for six to eight months um, of the of the year. Um, and um, yeah, it's it's just been it's been incredible um, just being and living in those um, in those situations and working with the children directly, being involved in their in their lives and um, and just being a listener. Um, I think that's that's what it's been. So yeah, I served as the as the program officer for about um, six to seven years, and then last year I transitioned to serving as its um, as its new CEO. Thank you, Sharmila, and for that, you know, experience of your, what brought you here. Can you share with us what to you, the live to serve um, uh, slogan that Amrita Seattle uses, what does that mean to you? It and means it's a, it's a life choice for me. You know, it's, it's my life that's, that's dedicated to this. And um, it's my, it's my purpose. It's, um, you know, what, what drives me is, um, you know, making, working with with children to make sure that you're that you're you, you're there for them you know like you would be for for your own kid um it's um you know there's it's yeah there's nothing from the books or textbooks or you know protocols um but it's um yeah it's just something natural that you do every day of your of your life and um yeah that's what it means to serve uh, selflessly yeah i can i can feel that when you talk you know that it doesn't come from a um, an academic perspective. It's from a human perspective, from, you know, reaching out to another, to a child that needs help. And what, what would you say makes Amrita Seattle's approach to support children and community members different from other nonprofit organizations? What's unique? I think it's, it's just that it's live to serve and period. That's it. You just, you do it because you're living to, to serve. And that means going, that means doing everything. You know, if you're working with a community, if you're working with a, with a child, with a student, you know, you, you take care of them with, with everything. I mean, uh, when Amita Seattle started out, um, we started out, my parents started the organization in, in 2010, you know, we started out working with, um, with the local school systems, distributing classroom supplies, setting up tutorials, meal programs and all. But it, it was through that, that we, that we saw that, you know, it's, kids are still struggling when you are, uh, when they have their, even when they have classroom supplies, their um, nutritional meals and everything, you know, it just needs so much more um, for, um, that elementary to sort of employment model um, to get yourself to employment. There's so much that that needs to go in, um, and um, 
it was, it's just, um, what we do is it goes beyond any metrics, you know, like we said in the video, um, it's, it's doing what every child, uh, uh, what every parent would do for their, for their own child. You know, that means taking them to the doctor's clinic when, when they're sick, you know, getting them, um, taking them on road trips, um, having birthday celebrations, going, you know, making sure that they have study sessions, making sure that they have access to, to tutorials, you know, making sure that they have, um, that they have shoes and clothes and, and proper proper care and um, and love and support, um, and that's why we started gradually. We, we we realized that we need to go deeper to really make um, an impact in the children's lives and and change and really make a transformative change in their life. We need to go um, we need to go deep and be there for themselves. Um, so I think that's what we do differently. Yeah, that gives a picture of how it's not like a traditional NGO necessarily. It's really the whole, the whole gamut of things a child would need, including the affection and the, the, the support as a, as a human being. Can you share with us what the um, education and community development uh, aspects of Amrita have been so far, and also the challenges you've faced, especially in this time of COVID, plus the, the, her, the um, cyclone Amphan that hit West Bengal earlier this year? What are some yeah. of those challenges? Yeah, it's been really hard. I mean, the the places that we work in, both in in Bengal and in in the Himalayas, are are very remote. Um, and I mean, it, in the in Bengal, it takes you know we have to cross uh, three or four rivers to get to some of the last villages in the in the Sundarbans areas. Um, students and the families face constant man animal conflict. In fact, just a couple weeks ago. Um, right from our village, uh, we lost uh, three to four people in one week from tiger attacks um, right in the village. So it's it's hard, you know, and people are living on very basic subsistence living um, in the mangrove forest or simple fishing, um, crabbing up in the Himalayas, you know, farming, herding. Um, some have simple um, jobs as wage earners, um, laborers or drivers, you know, um, uh, as load carriers, but it's, uh, so, so those communities are really hit, you know, folks that are already vulnerable, um, they're really hit by the, uh, the COVID's, um, COVID-19 restrictions for, for earning. So economic collapse is definitely, it's, it's, has been, has been really detrimental. Um, we've been, uh, we've jumped in like so many other orgs have um, to deliver food parcels, uh, basic PPEs, making sure that our communities and our students are, are safe um, and, and healthy. Uh, learning has transitioned to an online mode, but then again, a lot of the, the students who are living in the, in the last frontiers are unable to access um, the, the online learning mode, right? A lot of them don't have laptops. Everything has to be on, on phones, which has its own problems of, of monitoring and um, connectivity is always an issue, um, in the, especially in Ladakh. Um, there's also political disturbance right now. So network connectivity has been really hard. I mean, there are students who, with whom we could not connect for, for months because the military had cracked down and, uh, and jammed all network connections because of the China conflict. And, um, and, and, and we, we, I think, drove for 12 hours in the Himalayan wilderness to, to bring the kid back to, to us because she needed to get back into school. She was falling behind and there was no way they were getting any, any news. So it's, it's hard. It's, um, you know, it's what we do is deeply uh, human, deeply organic. And it's, it's not this rosy, uh, romantic, rosy picture of, oh, I'm doing uh, social impact work. I'm making, I'm making a difference in the world. You know, it's, it's, um, it's like dousing fire every day, uh, you know. Yeah, it's like having. Imagine having ten kids of of your own that you're you're dealing with, you know, and I, and each has their unique sets of problems. Um, so yeah, um, but so it's been the the relief efforts that we've been trying to do has been massive. Uh, the just getting the supplies into these remote regions just takes an immense amount of logistics. Um, yeah, so uh -huh. it's. Um, yeah, can you, but, you know, can our you, staff is very, very dedicated with it's, all imbibed with lift to serve kind of spirit. So it's, it helps. Yeah. <laughs> There's yeah. huge passion there and such huge need. Can you tell us, um, given that this is our, our fundraising campaign, our main one for the year, what are the, um, what kind of support does Amrita Seattle need and where are, what are our plans for this year? What are we going to be aiming for in terms of what our fundraising goals are and what it will do? Yeah, we need funding support to 
to help students transition to the online um, online learning system, you know, with technology, getting them access to data plans that, um, and um, getting them access to um, safe housing. So bringing students into our, our residential system that we have started this year, um, we are reopening our, our libraries and our learning centers slowly. Uh, so it's all going to, you know, and, and, and continuing our ongoing relief efforts, distributing PPEs, food parcels, all of that. Um, it's going to be it's going to be interesting seeing how the school systems will will operate. I think they're opening on October fifteenth. I hear in at least in Ladakh, and um, yeah. So great, thank you so much, Sharmila. Um, we'll hear more from you later. I know, um, but this was great to give us a sense of the the really deep and important work that uh, Amrita Seattle is doing in. Um, in India and in these remote, rural, very, very desperate situations in India. I would like to now, um, with pleasure, introduce Dr. Rukmini Banerjee. Dr. Banerjee uh, is, the, as I mentioned, the CEO of Pratham Education Foundation in India. She joined Pratham in 1996 and has extensive field experience in program implementation in rural and urban areas, as well as in research. Dr. Banerjee also led the AASER Annual Status of Education Report effort for 10 years from 2005 to 2014, which has been acknowledged nationally and internationally for its innovative model of household-based citizen-led assessment. She initially trained as an economist in India. Dr. Banerjee completed her PhD at the University of Chicago. Welcome, Dr. Banerjee. It's great to have you here and I, um, we want to take advantage of this rich background to ask a few questions to you. Um, one is, what would you say is the education system experience like for the majority of Indian children coming from low income and rural backgrounds as they attend the government schools? Um, thank you so much for having me on this panel. Uh, very inspiring to hear Sharmila talk about the work that they're doing in <clears throat> Ladakh as well as in Bengal. Um, big question. Let me see if I can just answer it in a very brief way. Um, a couple of, uh, couple of facts I think are very important. Uh, for a large number of children who are in school in India today, uh, particularly in the government schools, are probably uh, you know, the first in their families uh, who will reach the end of elementary school. A lot of people may have started school earlier, but don't have the opportunity to finish. And, uh, you know, some in numbers illustrate this really well. If you look at the, you know, we know that in India last 10, 12 years has had very high elementary school enrollment. But if you look at eighth grade enrollment, uh, even maybe sometime around 2008, 2009, and remember, we have about 25 million children in every age group in India, six-year-old, seven-year-old, eight-year-old, and so on, uh, give or take a few million here and there. Uh, in maybe 2000, 10 years ago, you had about 11, 12 million kids uh, enrolled in eighth grade, which meant that about half the age group was making it all the way to there. Uh, if you look at the numbers from more recent years, 2017, 18, and so on, you find that that number has gone up to 22 million. So a huge uh, increase in uh, the opportunity to stay on in school, at least till the end of the elementary stage. Now, you know, that comes with a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, comes with a lot of things. One is that the expectations, I would say that the schooling levels are going up in India, but aspirations for what this may lead uh, for the children and for the families, I think is a lot higher than what perhaps uh, actually happens. And I'm sure in um, the work that uh, Amrita Seattle do, uh, I think Sharmila already mentioned the struggle to go all the way from school, complete, and then get on to uh, maybe higher education or employment. So, you know, while, uh, you know, there may be a child from a family who's reached eighth grade, everybody expects that this child now go on and, you know, sort of uh, get an incredible job and the, the uh, future opportunities for that family will be changed forever. And I think that's un unrealistic expectations 
on very uh, fragile young shoulders. So on the one hand, schooling is going up. On the other hand, I think aspirations are going up a lot. Um, one of the issues that uh, we in Pratham have been working on for a number of years is that each year of schooling in India for a large number of children, uh, especially in rural areas or in government schools doesn't translate into equivalent years of learning. So you may be in school for eight years, but if we look at what you can do in terms of reading or whatever, you know, uh, is, a, is a lot less. And I think recently the World Bank or some big group in the US has come up with these learning adjusted years of schooling. So that what you really want is if you finish 10 years of schooling or eight years of schooling, you're at some level which says that, you know, at eight, eight, after eight years of schooling, you're able to do, you know, so many things, think about so many things and you're actually equipped to go on to the next layer. But I think on that front, we are a lot lower. And um, uh, for, uh, you know, it, it has a lot of uh, negative effects because children feel that they've gotten this far, but they really haven't gotten this far. So how do you deal with family aspirations while you yourself know that you're not really adequately able to cope with this? And I think at a young age, feeling inadequate is a really bad thing, you know, because young people are full of potential and that's the stage. And again, I think going back to what Sharmila said, what you're doing is really incredible because you're fulfilling the full potential of what a young person can do rather than dampening their, you know, uh, their uh, energy, their confidence in themselves and so on. So we feel that it's very important to feel empowered and to feel that you can actually uh, do a lot with yourself. And, uh, you know, while I, we don't claim to do, you know, many, many things that need to be done, much of our work is focused on ensuring basic reading and basic arithmetic, even if you miss the boat a little bit in the beginning because of various things to do with your family or your school or your context. But along with the ability to be able to read and to make up your own mind, comes a lot of confidence in your own ability to learn. So I would say that you know, India is at a very interesting stage. We've just had a new education policy that's been launched. The new education policy focuses on a lot of early building of foundations well. Uh, right now, of course, it's on paper. So we have to see how both the government and you know, people can make it actually happen. Uh, so that, Nancy, if you ask me this question five years from now, we'd be able to give you a different answer. That's that's very hopeful and very helpful. Can you also then building on that, especially thinking about this sort of COVID and post-COVID, you know, world, um, what can be done to help children, you know, to help them to build the foundations that they need and to catch up? Um, and then thinking also about nonprofits like uh, Amrita Seattle, you know, what can nonprofits do? And in these rural areas, do you have some advice or some guidance on this? I think, uh, you know, I'm sure everybody on this panel and as well who's listening, you know, uh, this has been an incredible time. I think our lives are changed in, you know, incredible ways, uh, both personally, professionally, organizationally. And along with all this uh, incredible disruption and discontinuity and fear and uncertainty and whatnot, I think has also come a lot of learning. Uh, my one uh, worry is that uh, you know, we see so much that is happening around us. And because of the, the environment we are in, perhaps we are not maximizing the learnings that you could get out of this setting. So if I go back to our large government school systems, I think they've been sluggish and kind of monolithic in many ways. But this big shake that has come to the system uh, um, uh, Sharmila referred to, you know, this online kind of education. You know, it's been a very, it's been very difficult. It's been very difficult, not just in remote areas, but also with populations who don't have access to some of these things. But I think what it has done, both at a local level as well as at a, a you know, more macro level, is to really think hard about different alternatives that need to be there to reach all children. So I find, for example, we work with quite a few governments that while, you know, even before COVID times, it's not like we didn't have lots of big problems, we did. But suddenly I, I think because of this shaking up, everybody's thinking about 
I've heard much more talk about the last child and we are not reaching so and so. Many of those children actually were not being reached even before. But the concern, because I think disaster situations change people's mindsets in some ways. So I hope that as we go forward, some of the things that you're facing today remain uppermost in our mind. You know, the fact that there is going to be increased uh, and perhaps supplementary reaching out to children through other means. Uh, perhaps this is not the first disaster that's going to happen. There's going to be, you know, we need to be ready for the fact that schools may be closed sometimes uh, and we still need to work uh, on, uh, uh, you know, on education. Uh, another thing I want to mention, and uh, we have to again see how these things pan out. I think parents have always been very important. Every child, any one of us knows that we didn't get to where we did only because of some school we went to. We know there were full families that were supporting uh, our progress ahead. But I think at least in India, I feel that the recognition that parents, often uneducated parents also, have played a big role in the last six months is something that needs to be celebrated, recognized, valued, and brought into the center because we have a huge resource in the form of parents who in many cases, if they were not educated, were distant from the schools, felt they were not adequate. And I think that today's role has brought them into the center space. And I think we need to take that along. So as somebody famous said, it takes a village to raise a child. And you know, of course, all famous people are always right. And so it, it's not just, a, I, think it, I, I think you must keep remembering this and that all those other people who helped in these difficult times and make them part of the fabric that will go ahead. Those are inspiring words, um, Dr. Banerjee. I really appreciate what you said, you know, building these solid foundations and, and keeping expectations at a reasonable level for these children, but also celebrating the successes, the parents who are stepping in, you know, and, and I, I can say that it, in the U.S., same thing is happening. I think it's something that's happening globally for children to make it through this time. Parents have to be more engaged, which is a good thing. So thank you so much for those words. I would like to now turn to um, Jacob Leaf and introduce him to you a little more fully. Um, Jacob is the founder and CEO of Ubuntu Education Fund, a nonprofit organization that provides comprehensive services to vulnerable children living in the townships of Port Elizabeth, South Africa, from cradle to career. He has developed an org the organization into a world-class institution that supports more than 2,000 children on their pathways out of poverty. Jacob has lots of accolades. He appeared in Fortune Magazine's 40 Under 40 list of most influential young people in business. And in partnership with the University of Pennsylvania Center for High Impact Philanthropy, Jacob Leaf was the host of the podcast series Philanthropy Unfiltered. So with that, I'd like to welcome you, Jacob, in, and being the, a very active parent at your son's sports game, I know um, we appreciate you joining here today and have a few questions for you. One is to ask you what you would say are the key ingredients to doing successful community development? Another very simple question. <laughs> sure. Well, thank you, Nancy, and thank you to Marita Seattle for hosting me. Um, I met Sharmila about um, three years ago now uh, through a course I taught at University of Pennsylvania, and she's been, uh, I've been working with her since and really love her commitment to what it takes to really raise a child. I think I've been doing this for 25 years and there are all these NGO models out there. Everyone's talking about their great innovation, but it doesn't matter if you're in the Himalayas or Mumbai or South Africa where I work or in Seattle, there is a way to raise a child. And it doesn't begin when the child's born. It begins in the first trimester. It begins with what goes into a woman's body. Is she caring for herself and so forth? And you then have to work with that child every day of their lives. That's how you, that's the only way. I loved where uh, Sharmila spoke um, earlier about having to give children everything every day because that is true sustainability. There's no extra strategy in raising children. And I really, I really believe that the most sustainable thing is to invest in a child every day of her life. And I think too many NGOs are focused on giving handouts and that's not how I was raised. Um, and it's not how I think any of you were raised. And, you know, you have to stay with your children every day. And that's really what it's about at community development. I love, Sharmila, that you spoke earlier about listening. Um, that's such an important word in all this. Um, 
I don't come from the communities that I work in. My team all does. Um, and we listen, listen, listen. So I think if I were to say what the real keys to community development are, it's to listen. One, it's to start as early as possible at Ubuntu. It's in the first trimester. Um, and then it's stick with these children every day of their lives. Um, I always tell people no dashboard we produce will ever account for the amount of hugs we give our children. And to me, that's really what it's all about. Um, being with them and treating them like you would in your own children, investing in the same way. And if it's not good enough for your own children, it's not good enough. It, it should be good enough for the children you serve. So um, I think those are the real keys to development. Thank you so much. Um, those are, are very inspiring words. Um, and, and I think so true and very much match what uh, Sharmila has said. In thinking about Amrita, Seattle, and their journey forward to establish a world-class institution, what has been your biggest challenge while establishing Ubuntu Pathways, and how did you go about resolving it so that we might learn some lessons? Sure. Uh, I think for us, it's the, it's the dynamic between the funding world and the practitioners. Funders, you know, they want to give you these 12-month grant cycles. They want you to go to scale. Listen, rate, there's nothing scalable about raising children. I have two boys of my own. And my wife's a physician, and in a lot of ways, it's harder for my children to fail in life than succeed, right? They have every privilege. I could imagine raising 10,000 children. I can barely do two children. We have all the privilege in the world. So I think it's, 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 it's to me, it really is about um, staying true to that, allowing your funders and communicating to them the importance of going deep into one community, what it takes to actually raise a child, and then you yourself sticking with these children. It really is so important. We cannot... Um, do it by simply giving handouts. We cannot do it by building 30 Ubuntu's or 30 Amrita's. It's a, you know, we're going to have to, if we're going to do this, we're going to have to go deep into one community. These communities, we talk about generational poverty. It is so unbelievably difficult to break cycles of generational poverty. And I, to me, it's about just staying with it because our kids are going to fall off. It's not all success, right? I mean, think about how many times our, our children fall off track. We've got to be there to pick them up. And it's a huge huge investment. So I think one of our greatest challenges is convincing our our donor base, the funders out there to really invest in the long term. A 12-month grant cycle, you can't raise a child in a 12-month grant cycle. Um, it takes a huge amount of time. I'm sorry, but there's an ice cream truck going by me. So if you hear the, the background noise, there's nothing I can do about that. Um, I think he's passed now. Um, so really, that's what it is about. That's what it is for me. It's about sticking with it um, and going deep, deep, deep into one community. That's, uh, that's great and it feels so true. Um, I think we can all relate to anybody who's a parent relates on the difficulty of that. And like you say, you multiply it times thousands. Um, and I think those words for donors are so important, you know, that it, people do make the commitment and recognize this is not a, a thing that can be done in a year or two. And Can I share a story about, a, I recently spoke at a high school and it was a privileged high school in, the, in London. And I went in there and all the kids were 17, 16, 17 years old. And I asked them each to write on a piece of paper how to rape a child. And they thought I was laughing. First I said, does anyone have children? They all sort of giggled and they said, no. And I said, well, write on a piece of paper how to rape a child. And I just started reading these things off. It's a, what I'm trying to say is we are looking for the great innovation in community development. I believe it's an old recipe that we know. And the, the, the challenge is, can we apply the same standards we do to our own children to the, to the, uh, to the disadvantage? And then, can we, and then can, we, can we afford the same dignity? And if you can do that, I believe we can truly change a child's life. That's, a, that's great. That's a great question to ask those kids. Um, and as you say, it's not anything new. It's just something that we have gotten awfully busy with our lives and technologies and pressures to, for parents to do. And, and um, as you were saying, um, Dr. Banerjee, you know, that's one of the things maybe coming out of COVID that we are being, parents are being forced to engage more, um, but it's not easy and they need support. You know, parents aren't trained for this. Um, so Jacob, like one more question about um, sure. kind of about breadth versus depth. Can you talk yep. about the, the lessons that you've learned about how to keep a balance between kind of the breadth of the work that you do and then going deeper as, as we move forward as Amrita, you know, how- Well, how I think I said it before, um, I don't believe in scale when it comes to community development. Um, um, I, as you know, I've had a, I, I stress this to um, Charbel all the time. It's just, you know, 
I've got 2,000 children all living either without parents, in shacks, or, um, you know, having been, 100% of my girls are abused by the age of 18. I can barely give these children enough resources. How am I supposed to go to scale? I've been doing this 25 years and we're just getting good at what we do. So I, don't, I actually believe uh, if, you, if, we, you know, if we're truly going to apply the same standards we would to our own children, it is impossible to take community development to scale. Now, all that being said, I have 25 years of um, experience and failures and challenges. And rather than trying to scale Ubuntu, can we leverage our, our knowledge and our skills base and help other organizations such as Amrisa? Or, and how do we take and package our information and what we've learned and what we've failed at and share that with other organizations. And that's something which we're looking to do. We are doing at Ubuntu, um, but I, I have no interest to build, go build another Ubuntu. I don't believe it would work. That's, uh, that sounds like a great idea of um, sharing lessons learned you know, with others, because it's, it's kind of by def definition, the sort of work that's being done by both Ubuntu and Amrita are right. not scale, not on large scale because that's kind of life. If we do it on large scale, it's it's like life. We all have to do right. it. So thank you so much, Jacob. We really well, thank you so much. Um, and I'd like to just just to, if I could just take a second to recap. I really believe start as early as possible. It's what we do when we have our own biological children. We start in the womb, right? And then stick with them through the hard times. Nothing, you know. We don't uh, achieve success in a twelve month grand cycle. We don't raise a child in a twelve month grand cycle. So it's a long term endeavor. And it's as Charmila said so eloquently before. It's about giving them absolutely everything every day. And that's, that's how you raise a child. And it doesn't always work. <laughs> but you do your best and which you're that's doing. That's right. That's right. Thank you. But I, I apologize to everyone if there's background noise in them. I am in a park. So well, it's all the only it's, place I can find. So. It's, a, it's a testimony I'm, to you walking your talk because there you are with your kid. At the, yeah, my child is playing in a, a soccer match as I'm speaking to you. So I'm sort of watching and, and participating. <laughs> We're happy that you're but here. I'm going to mute so there's no background noise now until the questions. Okay, thank you. Great. And um, next, I'm so pleased to be able to uh, introduce you to Ajit George. Ajit is the Director of Operations for Shanti Bhavan Children's Project. He's passionate. He's a passionate advocate of the transformative power of education for the underprivileged and socially discriminated. As director of operations, he manages various fields of operations, including fundraising, communications, partnerships, strategic planning, and mentorship and career development. Under his leadership, he has expanded the organization's donor base through grassroots channels, foundation support, and corporate partnerships in the US, Europe, and Asia. He has consulted for new and emerging nonprofits, especially in the field of education and poverty alleviation. So welcome, Ajit. We're so happy to have you with us today. Hi, Nancy. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Armala. I'm uh, very honored to be on this uh, incredible panel. So um, our first question for you, Ajit, is in the Indian context, what does it take to truly change the trajectory of a child's life who is coming from a background of generational poverty, illiteracy, and abuse, basically what Jacob was just describing. Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty complex question. And, um, you know, maybe the best example is to sort of use what we've uh, used as an approach for Shanti Bhavan. Um, Shanti Bhavan has been around for 23 years. And when we got started in South India, we looked at, you know, what government intervention was doing, government schools and other, you know, basic literacy programs. And we saw that maybe some kids would go into the program and then they would drop out at a pretty early age and then they'd go back to exactly where they were. So a few years of schooling and then um, they were kind of following their parents' footsteps. And we found that was really highly challenging. As you mentioned in the question, we also saw high levels of uh, uh, abuse, um, alcohol rates, alcoholism rates are in the 90 plus percentage in the, the demographic we serve. Um, physical and sexual abuse rates are in the 80 plus percentage um, at the minimum. And there's also childhood malnutrition. There's a lot of other challenges. And so we, we realized from our point of view that if we did not create a safe and loving and protective environment for the child, the child would not have a chance to, to study and have a good education. So we built Shanti Bhavan, which is um, a self-contained boarding school. Um, we're about 80 plus percent 
solar powered. We grow most of our own food. Um, and we've got 30 plus acres um, that the, the children live on, play in, learn in, um, and just uh, have um, grow up in. And they start with us at the age of four and they stay with us until they graduate from high school and then we provide um, for their entire college degree too so it's about 17 18 years of intervention per child and it covers everything and not just their education but their uh, food clothing um, you know medical expenses across the board the holistic level of intervention and uh, that is a, a central key, but I would say that's not the only key. Um, when you think about this holistic intervention, you know, Jacob kind of brought up as well, um, you need to be there um, in an emotional level. So it's a lot of emotional support, um, kind of, you know, not just being an educator or an administrator, but being a guardian, um, um, a, a friend, um, a, a well-wisher for the child to know that they, you care about their future, um, that you love them, um, and that you believe in them. Uh, I think believing in them and setting high expectations is so, so important. And the reason for this is what we noticed when we talked to our, our children um, is, you know, we'll ask them what their parents might think about their schooling. And often there's a disconnect. Um, their parents don't understand it. And often their parents have um, low expectations of what is possible in the world. And that's because they've been beaten down generation after generation. And so they, they don't see a future for themselves and they may not see a future for their children. I think, I think anyone that's a parent here will say that, you know, if you don't believe in your child, um, your child knows it. They'll, they'll see it in your eyes. Um, they'll see it in your face that you don't believe in it, um, believe in them we take the opposite uh, kind of position and say we have high expectations of return right? and we say hey we believe in you you can do these things um we will provide the the roadmap for that and we will support you through that um so we have a very intensive curriculum um and then we switch over for the early years that's an internally created curriculum and then for the later years we switch over to the icsc isc um curriculum which if, if people are not familiar is one of the toughest curriculums within india um, and we, we really um, guide them, support them, push them, and role model for them uh, what they can be um, so that they get very high scores on these exams and then go on to top colleges within India. And recently, we've also started training them for the ACTs and SATs, and they've been scoring in the 90, 95th percentile, uh, making them eligible for tier one, tier two colleges in the US um, and, and abroad. And those are, that's the sort of the next phase that we've, we've just started. So it's a really high pressure and push to get into, um, into quantum leap um, opportunities forward. Um, Soft skills is another big part, right? Uh, you know, it's not just about the education, it's about the ability to like be able to hold yourself in a meeting, um, to interview well for college, to interview well for workplace, um, to have a high EQ, not just uh, because we don't know, we can't control the IQ, but we certainly can like influence them on an EQ level and, and teach them how to be empathetic and connect with other people and care for other people. And that's all part of our curriculum. It's not like an add-on. It is baked into our system of how we approach it. Um, then, you know, of course, we support them through college. And there's a lot of, once they go into college, we're supporting them completely 100%. Um, sometimes they get partial scholarships from colleges and so on. But we're, whatever is not covered, we are covering. And um, we're guiding them through the college process, too. Um, for all of them, 100%, they're the first ones in their families to get to go to college. And so, they have no roadmap and they have nobody to talk to about it. So we have to be there to support them through that um, and guide them, not just financially, but um, in terms of how they think about their own careers, how they approach college classes, how they can make connections in college, um, how they go for internships, and so on and so forth. Then they go on to get their first jobs. And um, what's been fantastic is we've got a, our success rate is you know close to 100%, and um, they've been getting white collar professional jobs. And often I think we think in the US, or, or those who don't work maybe in the poverty alleviation development field, might often think that like poverty is just a equation of salary. If I am below, 
you know, 20,000 US or 15,000 US per year, you fall into a poor category. If I'm above this, I'm, uh, you know, I'm not poor. World Bank standards are like $2 a day, you know, to $2.25. Um, if you're above that, you're not poor. Below that, you are poor. Uh, we've learned, obviously, that it is much, much more complex than that. And poverty is sort of an intersection of multiple different degrees of issues going on, um, maybe debt, maybe housing, access to clean water, medical care, all of these things. And so what I would love to do is just read two anecdotes from our alumni. We just put together an alumni report. And this will kind of tell you from their own words um, what has happened with them. And these are kids who have graduated, finished college, and are now working. So the first one is, um, my family was in a lot of debt when I finished college. I had recently lost my father and had money lenders knocking on my door to collect money. I needed to clear all of my father's debt piled up from over the years. Thanks to my accounting and finance education from Shanti Bhavan and college, I was able to get money lenders to renegotiate terms of loans and I restructured the loans to pay them all, all over the next five years. For a long time, I used most of my income to clear the debt. Um, and that really shows you one of the biggest things that we have noticed uh, year after year. The kids are facing massive debts from illegal loans or, or you know, black, you know, um, off-market loans from, you know, these illegal money lenders. And uh, that's how the poor kind of survive without any other resources. The second one is uh, from, a, from a, another alumni who's about to go on to start her. She's just actually just started her MBA. It's been four years since I started working and I'll be leaving this month to pursue an MBA uh, on a full uh, scholarship. Working at Amazon for two years, I covered the house rent, cost of basic necessities, my father's de-addiction expenses, my mother's medical bills and my brother's education. However, for the four of us, we still lived in a single room with one shared bathroom and a kitchen. After Amazon, I changed my job to BF Corporation, a leading apparel and footwear company. With an increase in my salary, I moved my family out of the slum into a safer environment with a regular supply of water and electricity. I continued to pay for my brother to attend college and support my three cousins with their education since their father was killed. Apart from two full-time jobs I've held, I also work for, for many part-time jobs, teaching, babysitting on weekends, and content writing to support my family. And this, this last anecdote sort of captures the final aspect of like, how does a child get out of poverty? Well, they get out of poverty by, all, by this very level, high level of intervention, and then they give back to the rest of the community, their family, their extended family. Um, and that is really how we think about it. And we think about it not just one child, but we think about the ripple effect of one child impacting multiple other people and alleviating that group. You know, Ajit, if I could just jump in, I, I loved what you're saying, this long-term commitment. And, you know, you talk at the end there of citizenship. It's actually what the word Ubuntu means. It's a closer word that means I am because you are, that we're only as strong as our community. And as an end goal or North Star to say that one of your um, goals for your children is citizenship. What does it mean to not just take, but to give back? And however you define your community, your family unit, your church, your synod, whatever it might be. And it's something that I feel is missing in our education across the world at the moment. And I, I loved hearing you um, share those stories because it really resonates and it's, it really speaks to the philosophy of Ubuntu, what we're trying to do as well. So well done. And, you know, it goes back to Nancy, what you're saying about community development. It's about instilling that that idea of selflessness in, in human beings and humanity and each other. Thanks, Jacob. Sorry I, if I, I jumped in. No, no problem, Jacob. I just want to say that, like, I agree with that. That's, you know, our philosophy is that if a child gets out of poverty and does well for themselves, but then has no motivation to give back or to be a citizen of their community or has no well care about their family and the larger community they came from, we have failed as an organization. Um, that is not our goal is to not, is not to make a bunch of more capitalists that are only interested in themselves. <laughs> we're, we're very much interested in uh, rethinking the model of what it means to be a citizen in a community. And that's, we start with that very early, age four in assembly and lectures in the mornings every single day. And so the kids are hearing this for years through conversations in, in assemblies, through classroom discussions, through roundtables. It is all part of baked into the culture and ethos of the institution. 
That's great. I really, uh, I think it's a, it's a discussion. This dialogue, um, it, it seems to be missing in the development space. You go to uh, conferences and everyone's talking about huge outputs of numbers. Huge. I loved when she really said we have to roll and roll 300 more children. You know how hard it is to raise 300 children? I'm not saying that to anybody. I'm saying to all of us collectively how hard it is to raise a child and do it well and be there every day. So it's, um, it's nice to hear so many like-minded voices on this call. Thank you. Yeah, this is really inspiring to hear you all, um, you know, just to, to feel the commitment that is there and so clearly that it is not, it's the life of the child. I mean, to, to, to these descriptions you just gave, Ajit, of the successes and the ending, I mean, that generational poverty has surely been affected by, by these young people. It's, it's absolutely inspiring. Um, can, I mean, these questions, I, I feel like you've sort of answered, but if you could say, I mean, in thinking about Amrita Seattle and how we aspire to do deep interventions in a child's life in the Indian context, I mean, it's somewhat, I think you've already said a lot about it, but do you have anything more to say about how community development can be done well? And you've talked about many aspects of it, but is there anything else you would add? Um, you know, in terms of community development, we, we this is something that's actually a really good question in that, um, we don't want to operate as an island in isolation from the community. That's a very dangerous way outlook and that will create resentment from the community that we live in and we work in if we're not integrated with them. So we thought about this really early on when we, when he, Shanti Bhavan is located in the rural villages, um, pretty far from Bangalore. Um, there was next to nothing when we first started, you know, there's a bit of a more development since then. But we invested a lot in the community in building roads, um, in helping um, rebuild and restructure government schools um, that have, uh, you know, not the same kind of like intervention that we do, but we wanted to support as much as we could the local schools in the area. Um, we have recently uh, launched uh, lunch programs for the elderly in the village, who, especially elderly poor, who don't have access to food otherwise. So we give surplus food from Shanti Bhavan that we grow ourselves and we go into the villages and we deliver that daily. Um, we've created a savings loan program for um, a lot of the uh, villagers in the area as well, where we will um, match uh, the amount of money they put in and we'll put into a savings um, program. And then we will give them uh, that money back uh, as they, you know, as they retire and they need go forward, which has been really, really successful. And they've been really excited by that because they haven't thought about that process about saving for their futures. Um, we do a lot of parental buy-in, right? You know, the, the intervention program that we, are, we just described is 17, 18 years of intervention per child. And so it's hard for parents to kind of comprehend this. So we do a lot of discussion with the parents about this. But then we also talk to the kids about, you know, setting boundaries uh, if their parents are asking them to do things that are in, uh, un unsafe for themselves or dangerous for the, for the child, um, but also to be able to guide their parents into making better decisions, like maybe you don't take these loans out, or maybe you, you make a different decision about, you know, hygiene or, or, or um, access to food, right? Um, but we're a very strong believer that we cannot operate in um, isolation from communities we work in. We have to be um, a symbiotic relationship. Um, and that we have to give support to the community in some form or the other, even if their kids are not part of uh, the program. That sounds like a, a, a very, um, I mean, like a brilliant approach and not just brilliant, but the right thing to do. And I'm sure that that has an effect also on that, uh, you know, getting the support from those communities because the children are, you know, they're now being taken into the school system that you run at Shanti, Shanti Bhavan. And, so for, for the families or the others to feel like they are also benefiting is, um, is really impressive and moving. I think um, in interest of time, um, this has all been so rich and amazing. We will um, move and ask, uh, introduce Dr. Marguerite Theophile, Marga, um, to, uh, to speak. And I'm gonna just introduce you a little bit. Uh, this is a great, great description. Dr. Marguerite Theophile lives in Mumbai with her husband, um, Homayun Taba, three old trees and many plants and birds. <laughs> she loves with equal passion staying right there and working on her writing as well as traveling the world and manages to do both, or at least I suppose in previous times. <laughs> yeah. um, 
Well, previously working as an airline steward attendant, uh, stewardess, she also worked and received her PhD in philosophy in the field of sacred architecture. Currently, as co-director of orientation, she works as an organizational consultant with businesses and educational institutions. She is a story lover and conducts workshops on story work and healing, and also works one-on-one -on -one with clients as a personal growth coach. She founded Weave, Women, Earth, and Vital Encounter, a place to explore a lived spirituality. Welcome, Dr. Marguerite Theophil. It's great to have you. Thank you. And it's we been have so inspiring listening to the other panelists. I, I, it was a great learning. Thank you so much. Well, we're so delighted to have you and um, wanted to ask, uh, because I know you've been a volunteer in Ladakh, could you describe what your journey as a volunteer in the education sector has been like? Okay. Uh, one problem I have with the word volunteer, okay, because um, our approach started in a very, very different way because I hardly worked with children before I worked in Kashmir and Ladakh. As a corporate consultant, I worked with older people. Then we, we are really academics at heart. So we gave that up and we started working with teacher education for many, many, many years. And that's what actually brought me to Ladakh. For the first few years, this was 10 years ago, I only worked at a nunnery over there because of my interest in meditation and everything, and also working with the young students of the nunnery. And uh, the head of the nunnery, Dr. Palmo, introduced me to Mr. Ishe Tondo and uh, said, work with this school, just like that. And as you've seen, my life has sort of flipped from working into this, into that, and moving on somewhere else. And uh, I, I met with Mr. Tondup and I said, what are your needs? Because, you know, when we come from a bigger city with these great ideas, oh, Ladakh is resource poor and we can do this, that and the other. Uh, I find that so insulting towards the community we work with. So we talked to uh, Dr. Tondup. And by the way, we are not an NGO. We are not, we're just a group of individuals. We pay our own way. We struggle with that. And we, we work in education. So the people I bring with me to, to Ladakh are educators. Because again, as um, when we first worked at Lambda, we said, okay, there are a lot of people doing things with the children. Uh, there are some people who are coming from abroad and doing programs with teachers, but the, the curriculum and everything's so different from what it is in India. Now, Taba and I working with uh, Indian schools for a long, long time, and particularly one in Mumbai, the Father Agnel School, we begged the wonderful principal, please send your teachers with me. And that's how we started the work, because the need was in Ladakh, especially also in Kashmir, where I was before uh, helping out with some other NGOs. The need was that uh, there are no teacher training centers there. Okay, most of the teachers have finished their uh, BCom or BA or MA or whatever, and they teach. So, in terms of theories of education, <coughs> It's quite, it's quite difficult. And also the curriculum changes that keep happening and uh, the, the things that are expected of the teachers uh, were really confusing to them. So we brought teachers with a lot of experience. We brought educators, not volunteers, and uh, they had a lot of experience. And we set up first the teacher training programs based on what each of the schools needed. And, uh, my other passion is reading and books and libraries. And uh, when at the school, a uh, couple of schools, I saw the libraries, I wept. I wept because the libraries were just shelves of books, bad books, irrelevant books that were under lock and key. And uh, a helper, not, not a librarian, a helper, 
just flung books at the children and said, read. Guaranteed to make them hate reading. And that's how I met Sharmila. And we both wept because we said, no, 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 no. You know, the children, no wonder. And Sharmila went to a class and she phoned me when I was back in Bombay. And she said, I can't do this. They're hitting each other with the books. They're bored to death. They are tearing pages out of the books. And then we, we put our heads together and we came up with the idea of making the library an invitational space. Um, and, you know, I love what Ajit said, uh, Ajit, about the higher expectations, because the teachers turned around and told us, no, 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 these children, no, nah, they won't be able to do this, they won't be able to do that. And we said, hey, you know, no harm in trying. And we did. And uh, the teachers shut up because they saw how creative, how excited, how uh, brilliant the children's work. And they, they, they learned, they had to do their own learning. One more thing I want to say in a place like Ladakh, uh, you know, we imagine that it's, it's a place of, of uh, religion and meditation and whatever. And I, as a meditation teacher, found that teaching, especially the teachers, meditation, and also we teach meditation to the children as well, the library classes. Uh, there's a lot of stress in those places. We think only in our urban schools, there's tremendous stress, but there is tremendous stress in these schools and as a way for the teachers and the children to cope with the challenges this has been wonderful to see the results of that. So my, uh, I would say my connection with Charmila and other people that I worked with uh, is like a complementary project. You know, we found that we have different areas of working and uh, we, we found that our philosophy is the same. You know, we believe in, in the intelligence of the children. We believe that they, they want to learn and they're given a chance, they can do so, so much. And so we, we worked together with that first one school and we had great plans of doing stuff this year, which kind of fell through. But I also work in places like Mulbek, which is closer to Kargil and the border. And I found that uh, the teachers, needed to come and see education in different schools. So with the collaboration of schools in Mumbai, we have twice brought groups of teachers from Ladakh to be in schools uh, with a very different environment. So we set up amazing training programs with the help of these schools for these teachers and uh, Father Agno School just hosted everything for us and the teachers really had a wonderful experience and we were hoping to do this again. We just did it this year in January, luckily before the lockdown. So I think to be able to work in collaboration with NGOs, too many NGOs carve out little territories, you know, and the collaboration doesn't really happen. And with Munya, with Sharmila and Amrita Seattle, we found that this collaboration uh, helps us all. Uh, we have another collaboration with HealthWork that's also going really well over there. So I'm not very sure I answered your question, but I sort of went all over the place, but that's the work we do. It's great. No, I think you actually answered the other questions I had as well for you. This was really, really helpful. Just, you know, the, the belief in listening, again, that's a theme here in collaboration and in the children, you know, in what's possible when, when children know that they are believed in and there are expectations for them, that that's so transformative. So thank you so much um, for sharing your experience in Ladakh. And um, in the interest of time, we're gonna move now to um, Onith. Um, I would like to introduce Onith to the, um, Onith, Onith to the uh, group here. Um, Onith is the Amrita Seattle Pathway Fellow since 2015. Uh, she graduated from the Lambdon Model Senior Secondary School in March of 2020, so right when COVID really exploded. 
um, and graduated from the art stream. She is applying to universities to pursue her bachelor's degree in political science and international studies. Um, Oned has also been part of Amrita Seattle's Social Impact Lab in 2019, where she traveled for two and a half months to rural Bengal to learn and participate directly in how philanthropy and community service is done at the grassroots level. She aspires to become an Indian Administrative Services Officer one day. So welcome, Onit, and um, we're so glad you could join. And so sorry that um, Ishe Tundap is not able to join just because of internet connections, uh, I think. So um, I have a couple of questions for you. If you could tell us uh, what your journey has been like as a student with Amrita Seattle, and tell us about also the Social Impact Lab and the Mountaineering Institute that you were part of. Hello, I'm Ognit uh, from Ladakh. Uh, my journey as a student, uh, my journey as a student with Amita Seattle has been amazing. I must say, uh, I have been blessed for being a student of Amita Seattle for all these years and coming years too. Uh, I started my schooling uh, from government school. Uh, I did my uh, primary and um, middle school from there. After that, I got a chance uh, to get educated in one of the uh, best school of Ladakh, that is London Model Senior Secondary School. Um, because of Ma'am Sharmila, uh, because of Ma'am Sharmila, um, because of Ma'am Sharmila Pal, uh, my uh, guidance, my uh, mentor. London School is the most famous school of Ladakh. Uh, to get education, uh, to get edu to get education in such big school uh, is a huge opportunity, and it was a, a big challenge. Uh, for a student like me, uh, I did little the difficulties uh, in the beginning to cope up with the uh, to, uh, to cope uh, to cope up with the new environments. Uh, but then gradually, uh, I did my. Mm, mm, but then gradually, I at my best, work hard, uh, and and I was able to do well. I spent uh, four years at London School, uh, and the and the days was uh, and the days were uh, best days in my life. Um, my experience about the uh, my experience about the um, social impact lab and the mountaineering course uh, was beyond imagination. Mm, uh, I was one lucky girl who got chance to participate in such events. Uh, I was very excited to visit Kolkata and Darjeeling as it was my first ever tour outside Ladakh. Uh, during, uh, during our stay in Kolkata, uh, we visited many uh, villages in far flung area, uh, which are very remote. Uh, I can't believe that there is uh, there is some uh, remote place in Kolkata too. Uh, we distributed uh, sanitary pads and other essential items uh, for them. Mm, on other days, uh, we were uh, we went uh, we went uh, to set up libraries in different schools. It was fun-filled uh, experience as uh, we got uh, to learn, enjoy, and uh, explore many new uh, many new uh, things from 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 there. Uh, we exchange uh, different activities with the students, like dancing and singing with our traditional. Uh, uh, sing uh, songs uh, and mountaineering was one, one big challenge um, uh, challenge uh, task uh, for me uh, we did 15 days course at um, a world famous mountaineering institute 
uh, Institute, that is uh, Himalayan Mountaineering Institute at Darjeeling. Uh, climbing with the equipments and under the skilled guidance, under the uh, skilled instructor, uh, instructor was really a challenge, was really a technique learning for us. Uh, it was uh, superb as we were close to nature. The climbing at uh, the, the climb the climbing adventure has developed confident in me and uh, and interest to join such trip in future also. Thank you so much for that um, great description on it. Um, it's uh, it gives a really full picture of how much that has been important in your life and the opportunities that you received from doing this. And um, and and we want to know um, what is your advice to younger children, students who are entering into Amrita Seattle programs of how to take advantage of these programs or how it might affect them. How what would you say to them? <clears throat> Being a fellow, uh, being a fellow student of Amrita Seattle, I would suggest the upcoming students uh, to work hard, um, be positive, and be uh, and and to focus whatever uh, they do, uh, whatever they do. That's good advice. It sounds like that's what you did, and it worked very well for you. Um, Thank you. Thank you so much for for sharing this your experience uh, and and we have a couple of questions that we wanted to just pose to everybody um, for a few minutes before we wrap up with a video. Um, so one question is I think a lot has been said about this already, but is there anything more that you would suggest in terms of the kind of education, practical skills, and advocacy that should be integrated into the curriculum? of early childhood development programs so that the child can ultimately make these wise decisions and independent, um, be independent out of the outside forces and to protect their families and homes. So again, I think you've all spoken about this in some way or another, but Ajit, I wonder if you wanted to, to say anything more about this to begin with and then others can chime in. Sure, I, um, I covered a little bit about how we, we, we think about this philosophy philosophically at Shanti Bhavan, but certainly one area that um, we have seen, you know, some serious issues in which we feel is very valuable to work with children at an early age and throughout um, their time with us is to thinking about feminism um, and thinking about gender roles within uh, Indian society. Um, you know, the communities we work with are deeply patriarchal and um, there are enormous uh, biases against women um, and that manifests in so many different ways, including, um, you know, female infanticide, uh, but early child marriage, um, abusive households, um, limitations on, on options for education or careers. And we want, uh, when we teach feminism at SB, it's not, at Shanti Bhavan, it's not simply working with the young women, but it's also you're working with the young men because the young men have to be uh, partners in a better uh, society and a better community. Um, they should go on to be um, good uh, partners to, um, you know, um, to whoever they marry um, and they should be equitable in their, um, you know, their thinking. And so we want, to, we do work with both our young women and our young men at an early and that's one of the things that I would say that is valuable to think about uh, in education. That is such an important message. Um, it's it resonates very deeply with me having worked in global health and for, focused on menstrual health. It's the the men and boys have to be so much a part of this whole conversation um, for there, anything to change. So thank you for those comments. Do others have things that, that you would add to this? Yeah, I'd like to say something about. Uh, in the curriculum in our Indian schools, we have something called value education, which is so preachy. It, um, it, th the structure is so do this, don't do that. And uh, we found that we work through story. We just, we just use a story 
and we don't do that what is the moral of the story kind of thing. But we ask the children to enter the story, to write from different perspectives. And Rukmini, I love the Pratham books. They just help us so much, so much. And uh, we, we read them the story, we enact the story, they write different endings, you know. They turn the good characters into bad characters, bad according to the children, and they turn the naughty characters into characters who actually achieve something. And in all that, without using the word values, without saying this is good, that is bad, the children tell us. The children tell us and they teach us. Sometimes they really surprise us because they come up with the most unexpected things. <laughs> Sharmila, we've had so many experiences yeah. with that. They just make us laugh and they make us joyful with what they can they can come up with. And so this this idea about teaching through story without getting preachy and also to help the teachers that you you don't need to rely so much on lecturing, you know, to trust the children to do participated things. In India, we also have this thing about the classroom should be so quiet. So sometimes we've had the noisiest classroom where they have a lot of fun and there is discipline, but they're allowed to be noisy. They're allowed to be excited about what they're learning. So to convince the teachers that a quiet classroom is not necessarily the best. So this is something we're constantly working on to get more participation from the children, to get more discussions, and one more thing I'll very quickly add is um, with slightly older children, uh, we teach thinking skills. You know, we think it's very important because decision making and thinking skills, there's a wonderful lady in the US, Patricia Gorman Berry, and she has this BrainWise program. Munya, we did the BrainWise program with the teachers, with the students, which just helps children to look at consequences of their actions and things like that. So I think that kind of work, to do more of that work, is something that we're trying very, very hard to get educators. And the children get excited about it very easily. But we have to work at getting the teachers to feel a little more confident in doing something in a different way than they've been used to. They're understandably nervous. That's great. Great, Marga. Thanks so much for those those points. I think we all relate to stories, and um, and those that encouragement to think for ourselves is so important in this world that we live in. Um, it's increasingly important. Does anybody else want to add to that uh, question before we we start to wrap this up? We have yet another video to watch, and I want to show the campaign information one more time. But anything else to add? Yeah, I think. Um... You know, um, with our learning centers uh, that we have established, um, with the programs that we that we run every day, and with the with the residential uh, home uh, that we have set up, started to set up this year, um, you know what um, it's been it's been one incredible incredible ride for for us and for for the children. Um, our learning centers, uh, both in in Ladakh and in West Bengal, they are state of the art in in that community. With you know, and they're overfilled with with everything that that a kid needs to. You know, we have we have essentially all the Pratham books of our uh, curriculum at the learning center. The activities are all based off of off of that. Um, and um, you know, there are puppet shows. They have Legos to to play with. They have building blocks. I mean, and you know. Marga, you've seen, right? You've, you've been to our, our libraries in Ladakh, right? My boutique library. Yeah, and 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 some of those, um, some of a, a lot of it has been built by by the kids. Kids paint and they've painted the walls. They have, uh, you know, organized the books. They they've you know they've even hauled um, the the bricks in in wagons, you know, from from the truck station to to the library for the construction workers to to build them. So they are very much part of the community. And Ajit, how you were saying, you know, you have to be a part of the community and then and make learning fun and and and, and then also be a listener and take take care of of children's needs and see if they are they're happy. So 
it's it's hard. It's it's a twenty four hour um, thing, and it's uh, you know. But it's it's through these processes that at our learning centers, the kids have. It's not just a place that they know they have to. Uh, they have to go because they they have to go they they want to they want yeah. to come because we've seen i mean uh, on the notice board for example it says in the op library opens on sunday today at 10 a.m or something and i'll be waking up at 7 7 30 and and the kids would be there and i'm brushing my teeth i'll be like ma'am Le, we are here i'm like wait it's 7 30 I, I haven't done my dishes i need to like war, you know because you're like well we don't have it you know we're here <laughs> and what are you going to do? You know, you open the doors and, and they're there. They've spent, they literally spend their entire day in the library, in the learning center, because they know that, that that's where they feel safe. That's where they are with their friends. It's a other, you know, the other, op- previously they would be just running around in the streets, you know, and it's, it's you know, it's a safe place for them to, to come together. And that's what, um, and grow and think and, and laugh and, and have fun. And a lot of fun. Yeah. And the amount of engagement that we have seen is is incredible. I mean, I've seen kids who in, in class with the, the same child, I would work with them in, in the class, in the school during the daytime where, you know, they are all over the place, you know, not paying attention or just, you know, the, the stuff that you're saying just blowing off over their head. But, and then I would see them at my learning center opening a new box of Legos and, and, and building like a, a Pretty complex structure and following the instructions from the book, you know, and the amount of engagement and concentration, like she, you know, she's not looking anywhere else. And for hours, she's at one spot, just focused, you know, it was, those, it's just incredible um, to see what kids can do when you give them um, resources, when you give them opportunities, when you, when you're there for them as, as, as a parent. And, um, and if we uh, forget when we do the breathing before the, before every session, we do a breathing practice and a centering practice. We we sometimes are in a hurry and we forget, and the children go, "I'm late." Hmm. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We forgot what, our happened? what happened? Yeah. yeah. And they know yeah. that it's a different place because you you reinstate them every day. Like I just said, it's built into that space, and it's built into you know the the, the meditation, the care for each other, the the fact that you are an adult that will listen to them and and be there for them, you know, it's, yeah, that spirit comes out from, from every break that those, that, that's built into it. So it's, um, yeah. So well, it's, I have to go back there soon. <laughs> I want I think we're, we're going over time here. So um, we should, we should wrap up and it's late for folks in India. Late for folks in India. We are so grateful to this group of panelists. It's just been a privilege and a pleasure to have all of you on. Thank you so much for taking your time to share your wisdom and your experience and your commitment to this to children and um it's it's really been very moving to be part of this um so thank you and thank all of those online who've been listening in and and uh, posing questions and we also want to just remind you um uh, that this is the fundraising campaign and so we have uh, the live links that have been there posted i think we're they're showing up also now um and the, the, t- the texting information, uh, this shows the people that have contributed during this webinar. You, obviously you can continue to contribute, please do use these links and go to the auction where there are all these um, exciting things that are, are being auctioned off. Uh, many, many ways to contribute. There is a list here of what your donation will get in terms of supporting this rich programming that Amrita Seattle is doing. Um, I also want to call attention to the upcoming um, activities in addition to these fundraising efforts that you'll see that will be online. Um, there is a webinar next weekend on, um, on menstrual health, which is something I'm passionate about, that periods don't stop for pandemics. So um, there'll be a great uh, panel of experts um, speaking on this next, next Saturday, same time, same place. Come back, please. Um, and in between, there are going to be a series of concerts um, that will you'll see the information available here. And you can always go to the um, Amrita Seattle website. Uh, but there's one, um, one happening tomorrow um, that you're seeing here, uh, Dewani and others coming up, some very exciting ones coming up. Also, um, just to know that there are opportunities to volunteer for Amrita uh, Seattle, both locally and globally. 
in the project sites. And obviously right now, it, you know, we'd have to discuss in terms of going to India, but please contact um, Amrita Seattle and uh, we will be discussing, we're happy to discuss the opportunities. Um, there are also virtual volunteer opportunities of, that are available currently. So we're gonna show one brief video as our closing. And I would just like to thank you once again for participating um, and to all the panelists for being part of this. It's been, it's been a, a privilege and a pleasure. Thank you everyone so much for, for joining in. It's, it's late in India and, and as, we, um, as we close, we'll close with this, with this final video. Um, but thank you so much everyone for being here. Sorry, I'm having trouble playing that video. I have it pulled up here. I can, if you allow me to share screen, I can start it. If Perfect. you're having sure. trouble, yeah. Okay, it says I'm disabled to share. Okay. Um, so when you do that, make sure to say, use computer audio. It's a box oh, yeah, at the bottom left. Right. A great river always begins somewhere. Often it starts as a tiny spring in the mountains and then joins hands with other tributaries to grow as it finally plunges into the sea. So when people ask me why Amrita, the essential answer is that we reacted to a set of problems by focusing on what could be done. As it turned out, the idea sprang from my roots, merged with many other sources of knowledge and action to form a confluence that grew bigger than I would ever have imagined. Amrita Seattle breaks the cycle of poverty by creating pathways for vulnerable children living in some of the most isolated rural regions of India and Nepal. Our modules of education, healthcare and advocacy guides children from elementary to employment. We work in the island villages that are tucked deep within the Sundarbans mangrove forests in West Bengal and in remote isolated Himalayan villages in Ladakh and Nepal. We refuse to leave no children behind. In rural isolated India, due to poor infrastructure and abysmal resources, families very often have to give away one or more child to a well-off family in the cities. The child lives with a foster family and serves as a labor and is completely dependent on them. School takes a low priority and they remain as a source of cheap labor for the rest of their life, unable to become self-reliant and break the cycle of poverty.
Fact model drives deep into the communities we work with. We focus on the number of lives changed and relationships built versus the number of children reached. I cannot change a population of 1.3 billion, but together we can create a model solution that can be a blueprint for rural community transformation. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you, everyone. I hope I shared the video. I, in the middle, I had an inkling feeling that I didn't click share and yeah. It was there. Thank you so much, Shamil and everybody. This was Thank awesome. you so much, everyone, for being here. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Good night and good, good day. Good night. <laughs>